Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Today we have a really important subject to talk about, and we have the expert with us, Dr. Scott Hahn. We're going to talk about, is there surfing in heaven? That, that's the question everyone that I know is asking. So when we get back, we'll have Dr. Scott Hahn uh, dig down into the theological implications of that. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine. Roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm going to share with you a, a, an experience that I had that was the most phenomenal experience I've ever had. Uh, I got a phone call that my mother was dying. I flew in that night from Hawaii to where they had moved to Minnesota. I brought lays, plumeria lays, tuberose lays, beautiful fragrant lays. Got to her hospital room and, and laid all these lays on her bed because they loved Hawaii. They lived here for many years. My dad was a deacon in the island of Molokai, you know, St. Marion and St. Damien's Island, and they, he was a deacon in Maui. And now they ended up, had ended up in Minnesota, I guess because of medical reasons. And uh, I brought all these lays. My mother loved the, the Hawaiian lays, draped her bed with them. And I remember early in the morning, just about sunrise the next day, I went into her room. We were taking turns. And there was a moment when she was by herself. And then I went into her room and I opened up the curtains. And it was just the beginning of that, that first um, kind of glint of sunlight. And uh, everyone else came in then too. And I saw suddenly a bald eagle flew towards her room. Now my mother and father's home on the North Shore of Minnesota before they moved to Maui was called Eagle's Rest. And uh, it was where my dad held uh, retreats for presidents of businesses, ca Catholic retreats for presidents of businesses. And uh, the only way you could get there was by following the, the flight of the eagle through these backwoods, you know, the dirt roads with no signs. <laughs> Whichever way the eagle was pointing, that was the fork in the road that you took. And they, their name was Eagle's Rest. You know, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And it was their, their favorite song was Wind Beneath uh, uh, My Wings by uh, Israel Kahanamika Ole, his version of it anyway. And when he was ordained deacon, that was their song that they sung. So an eagle was very important to, to them. And as I opened the curtains, the, rest, the whole rest of the family gathered about that same moment. And this bald eagle flew towards her room from across the, the river. I think it was the Mississippi River down below. And the river, and the eagle came and kind of flew and then came back across her window again and then flew within about 20 feet of a window and then took off. And from that moment, I noticed my mother's breath totally changed. It went to that, you know, that certain breath that people have when they're dying. And she had, she had been unconscious for eight days. My mother had had a stroke 20 years earlier, so she had very much difficulty communicating and speaking. And everyone in the room knew my mother was about to go. And her breath shallowed and shallowed. And then she took three last breaths. And then this is what she said. Oh, oh. Oh, and then she breathed her last as she entered, you know, into glory. And it was like, there's no doubt in any one of our minds that she had seen the beatific vision, that she had seen uh, heaven. And uh, I couldn't shed a tear of sorrow because I was so thrilled where my mom was. And now my dad is, a, who's a, who is 92 years old. I recently sent him this beautiful book by Dr. Scott Hahn, Hope to Die. I took the cover off. Dr. Hahn, so I didn't mess it up when I read it. I sent my dad this book, Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. Dr. Scott Hahn is here with us. He's the Father Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology, which uh, at, at uh, Franciscan University, where I keep trying to work my way towards a master's degree online. And uh, of course, is the founder and president of the St. Paul Center. Dr. Hahn, welcome to our show. It's such a joy to be with you, Bear, and thank you for the invitation. Well, your book, um, the, the Lamb's Supper, I had, I had been a charismatic Catholic and I had been under catechized and I just wanted to go deeper with God and I ended up drifting from the church, not because I, not for any negative reasons, I just wanted to go deeper and I didn't have that, I didn't know how to go deeper other than with my Protestant friends. But my dad sent me the book, this book called The Lamb's Supper. Uh, and I thought, you know what, very definitely the Eucharist 
is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. I became convinced of that through your book, but I still kind of was wandering, and then I read Stephen Ray's book, Crossing the Tiber, and that was it. I came roaring back. But I want to I want to ask you, and so thank you for your personal role in my returning to the church. But I wanted to ask you, what happened to my what happened to my mom at that moment? What what happened next? Well. One thing we do know for sure, and that is that those who die in a state of grace enter into the presence of God. Now, it might be a preparatory phase for many souls. We call it purgatory, but you enter into that with the certainty that you are destined to see the face of God forever and ever. Or if you pass, if you bypass purgatory and you enter into heaven, you still are in a penultimate or preliminary state. We don't usually think about this, but when the disembodied soul enters into the glory of God, in a certain sense, that's the Old Testament of heaven, precisely because you don't have your body back. And so the fullness of glory occurs at the eschaton with the general resurrection, when all of us basically catch up to Jesus and Mary by getting not just our bodies back in a resuscitated form, but getting our bodies back in a way that is truly transfigured, divinized, and glorified in such a way that it goes beyond our wildest dreams. Our highest hopes will be surpassed when we enter into that glory in a fully embodied way. And that's really what this book, Hope to Die, is about. And that's why you may have picked up on the kind of line of God's own love. The the line of the logic of God's love is what connects the Lamb's Supper to hope to die. The Lamb's Supper was subtitled, The Mass is Heaven and Earth. Mm -hmm. It's the catapult whereby we receive the resurrected body of Jesus and the Holy Eucharist in order to set into motion a chain of transformations that goes beyond simply changing bread and wine into Christ's real presence. It really is Christ in his immortal body, you know, we were swallowing him up, but really he's assimilating us to his body and preparing to fulfill the pledge he gave his disciples almost exactly one year earlier when he said in John 6, if you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, I will raise you up on the last day. And so from the Lamb's Supper to hope to die, there is a line. And you're one of the very few to mention the Lamb's Supper. And I have a sense that there might have been a convergence or a sense of resonance when you were going through Hope to Die because it is also so Eucharistic. It, it has to be. You know, let, let's oh, back yeah. this all the way up then. Okay, we, my, what happens when my mother, something amazing happened. Okay, let's back this all the way up. Uh, let's back this all the way up to just before Jesus died on the cross. Where was Abraham? Well, we speak in Luke's gospel, or we read, of Abraham's bosom, and that was already commonplace in the intertestamental period. So Second Temple Jews believed in a place that they would call Sheol. Now, Sheol usually gets translated Hades into the Greek, but Hades is not the same as hell. That's the reality that Jesus refers to as Gehenna. So Sheol in the Hebrew, Hades in the Greek, is basically translated into purgatorio because it is a place of preparation. It is a place of purgation. You have the certainty of heaven in Sheol, so Abraham did. But at the same time, you are in a netherworld. You are in a shadowy realm. Now, some of those might be going through a punitive and painful purification. I doubt very much if Abraham was. But the fact is, All of the Old Testament shows us heaven, but it took a rabbi to kind of show me the obvious. Hiding in plain view was the the plain and simple fact, and Rabbi Berman is the one who put it out to me, that heaven in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, is only and always occupied by angels, period. There are no saints in heaven in the Old Testament. And so at the moment that Jesus is preparing to die, His body and soul will be obviously separated because his death is real. But his soul is going to descend into the netherworld, into Hades, into Abraham's bosom, into Sheol, in a triumphant act of deliverance. And so Paul refers to this in Ephesians when he speaks of leading captivity captive, descending and then ascending into heaven. For what reason? Basically to repopulate heaven. So as you move from the book of, you know, 
I should mention one thing, that in the book of Daniel, Rabbi Berman points out that you do have the sole exception because there in Daniel 7, you do have a vision of the saints of the Most High entering heaven and receiving the kingdom of the Most High, the kingdom of God. But that's the exception that proves the rule because that's the climax of the vision of Daniel 7 Mm -hmm. where you see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days to receive this kingdom, and then he turns around and gives it to the saints of the Most High. So here is the Son of Man on the cross, being lifted up to to be glorified, but then to descend in triumph to deliver all of the souls of the faithful departed of the Old Testament into the glorious presence of heaven. So, you know, Abraham was the one who sort of leads the way as the the founding father, our, our, our spiritual father. That's why it's referred to as Abraham's bosom. And so that moment is so much more significant than most homilists ever give credit. And it's not just the moment of his final breath, but also the moment when his soul descends into Hades in a way that is truly glorious, hidden, mysterious, invisible, but triumphant. Well, we're going to talk more with Dr. Scott Hahn about his new book, Hope to Die, which I don't usually say. Let me, Someone brought a book on to have on my show. We have guests that we really want to get to know. This is just my excuse to have Dr. Hahn on my show. We're going to talk more about that. What happened? What were those? They, saw, they said they saw people who had died before walking around and things like that. What's the difference between uh, dying and your soul going to heaven? And, and is there such a thing as your body being resurrected? We'll be right back. Dr. Scott Hahn, if people want to find you, what's the best place to track down your ministry? Well, for the last 20 years, we have this thing called the St. Paul Center. So I would say just go to stpaulcenter.com. You'll see all of my books, my talks, and many other resources as well. And if you want to find out more about the Bear Wo- about Bear Wozniak, you go to deepadventure.com. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, we believe at Deep Adventure Ministries that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And I've had men come to me and say, you know, I, I see your skydiver, black belt, all this kind of running with the bulls. I'm torn between adventure and, 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 and uh, you know, taking care of my family. I mean, I have this pull. And I go, dude, the most exciting thing you can do in life is ha- bring an eternal being into existence. To be a father and a husband, there can be no greater adventure. There can be nothing more challenging to, than to will the true good for your family and lay down your life for them. But when you have a child, that's an eternal being. We're talking with Dr. Scott Hahn about where, what happens with this eternal being? We live forever. Do we live in heaven? Do we live in hell? What, 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 is, what, what, what is that question no one wants to ask? What's that step just beyond the grave? So, Dr. Hunt, I have another question. I want to go back to where we were. And that question is, uh, on the cross, the two other prisoners, Jesus, one of them believed and said, Jesus, remember, remember 
me when you come into your kingdom. What happened to that? That uh, well, there was one that denied him. What were the two potential places those people, met, those two men, ended up on that at that moment? Well, we do know from Jesus' own words, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." That this penitent thief was transported to a place that went beyond his wildest dreams. You might say, wow, you know, it's almost a Protestant view of salvation where he exercises faith alone and performs no good works. But if you look at Luke's account, you're going to see that in about two or three minutes, it must have been, he confesses his own sin, the fact that he's worthy of death. He rebukes his fellow thief who is blaspheming our Lord. He confesses his faith in Jesus to be the Christ and the King. Remember me when you're coming into your kingdom. He does more good works in maybe two or three minutes than most of us do in two or three months. <laughs> and so he is ushered into the glory for which he was made. And, you know, at the same time, he did what Fulton Sheen once said. His final act of theft was to steal heaven. <laughs> so Fulton Sheen. So if we went to paradise, that would have been probably Abraham's bosom. He, he, he was, you know, comp, you know, and then, and so this, this is the, the confusion a lot of people have. I know I did, reading, not understanding the Greek, and and that, the concept that when Jesus died, he descended into hell. You know, the the, the word hell is the the meaning of that word has changed over the years, over the centuries, uh, our our understanding of that, the usage of it. But did he actually? He didn't go down into the realm of the devil. No, that's right. He, he didn't go into the realm of the damned. He didn't experience the torment of the damned. What he did was to exhibit the triumph of divine love manifested in his own humanity. And so his death is not virtual. It isn't apparent. It is real. His body is laid in the tomb and his soul descends into heaven. But this is a curious fact because the, the humanity and the divinity of Christ are inseparably united not only at his conception, but even now at his death. And so his divinity is united to the body. His divinity is united to his soul, even though his body and soul are separate, or it wouldn't be a real death. And so when he descends, it is a divinized soul. And this is what the the patriarchs and the prophets and the saints of the Old Testament would see. And so in Matthew 27, and only in Matthew's gospel, He describes how after the resurrection, all of these tombs surrounding Jerusalem were opened, and saints, the the souls of the faithful departed, in their bodies were seen. Now, this is a special sign. It is not the rule, but the exception, because this does not ordinarily happen. In fact, we don't have any record of it ever happening again, but it happened at the most decisive point, precisely the hinge of salvation history, where Mm. everything turned from the old to the new. So, so... The, the next question is, so Jesus dis- descended into the netherworld, to Abraham's bosom, where those who were on their way to heaven were waiting for him. Can you imagine the excitement they must have? I wonder if the herald a- angels who spoke to the shepherds, if the ones in Abraham's bosom had that sense that he's coming, he's going to be here any day, any moment. Jesus is coming to, to uh, lead us up into heaven. I wonder what that was like when he, when he saw those saints. Well, you know, so far I have been delving into a fair bit of speculation, so I want to yes. place brackets around what I've been saying in response to your questions, because the questions are good, but when we get to heaven, we'll look back and realize, okay, the answers weren't so good, because <laughs> it was just too much speculation. We don't know much more than what we do know. And so, you know, we know a little bit, we don't know much, but we know enough to recognize that why is this so central in the creed? You know, because he went down to deliver those who had been waiting and then took them up with him in the ascension. And as I said, he repopulates heaven. So in the Lamb's Supper, I point out something that is, you know, again, uh, hiding in plain view. And that is heaven consists of angels and saints. And in the Old Testament liturgy, the Levites are slaughtering animals down on earth, whereas the angels are singing the holy, holy, holy up in heaven, Isaiah 6. But after the ascension of Jesus, following his resurrection, he takes this host of the faithful up there so that when John the seer has his visions that we read about in the apocalypse, 
you know, it's it's almost it would almost be better if we could defamiliarize ourselves with that in order to come back and look at it through brand new eyes. And we would be as mm. startled and amazed and joy filled as John, because it's like, oh, my goodness, they're in heaven. They're in glory for all eternity. No more waiting except for their glorified and resurrected bodies, which will be the most grand climax of all time. And we get to have that encounter with the saints every time we go to Mass, because that beautiful painting in the Vatican Museum, uh, the Sistine Museum, where they're having Mass on earth and the Eucharist is raised, and then you have the saints worshiping. It, it Describe that, that unity of, of, of the communion of saints at every Mass. Well, first of all, let me back up. And since <laughs> you know, you're my conversation partner, I am going to say that as the wave of death overtakes us, we're going to enter into a glory that will make your surfing look pale <laughs> in comparison. You will catch the greatest wave and have the greatest thrill and a kind of divine exhilaration where we'll realize this is what we were made for. Oh. And the most exciting earthly adventure in the past will look like a garbage dump compared to the next you know, mm. 10 trillion years, which will be <laughs> you know, the first 15 seconds of eternity. <laughs> yeah. now, the other thing too, I, I think of you and you know, the, 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 the different kinds of pilgrimages you've gone on, you know, in terms of motorcycling. And it's been a long time since I rode a cycle. But I tell you, I, I think the power of the engine of God, the mm. Holy Spirit will transport us with a speed that will thrill us, again, beyond anything we have ever known on earth. And this is going to be heaven forever. And I, I think people are going to hear me and say, wow, you know, that's a little exaggerated. That's solely, that's sort of like holy hyperbole. You can't I assure possibly, you, it's you not. can't possibly be the more hyperbolic is, about that. <laughs> that's right. When you get to heaven, you're going to enter not only into a unity with God, where you will see God and know God and love God as He loves us and knows us, but because He's an Almighty Father, guess what? It's going to be a family reunion that will make the happiest vacation like nothing in comparison. And and you'll look back, and everybody who hears my words will realize that once again. Han's words fell flat on their face. <laughs> he wasn't exaggerating. He was grossly understating the joy. And we need to recover this now, mm. perhaps more than any point in our own life experience, at any point in recent history. Right. Because we not only, fa- we, we not only face this cultural crisis, you know, we face the pandemic, we face the crises within the church as well. And the church in heaven is not a different denomination than ours. There's one church, and it's Catholic, not just global. It's heaven and earth, and up there, the true blue members are in, in glory. We're in grace. We're vulnerable. We could fall into mortal sin. They can't, but their prayers sustain us because they're older brothers and sisters, the likes of which we've never known, even with the best siblings we could find. And we get to you know, suddenly go, oh, so you're my guardian angel. Yes. You know, speaking of brothers and sisters, and then there's the guardian angels. You know, I just, I think about every now and then out talking, you know, having that conversation. So remember that time when the, the big wave and you, you, you remember, was that you? Yeah, that was me. I'm the one that saved you. <laughs> or, you know, do you know like those kind of conversations? I was just thinking of Archbishop Wenske in Miami, who leads these men's pilgrimages on on Harleys, you know, mm-hmm. and they're going to discover a whole new group called Heaven's Angels. Amen. And how they were accompanied in the whole way. Amen. You know, by the way, do you know we did an uh, episode with Archbishop Wensky? And uh, I, I we just. I lo- yes, oh, I don't was... you love him? That guy is so <laughs> oh. tough. I kept saying, Archbishop, shouldn't we turn out, pull over? No. It was like 100 degrees, 100 and, I don't know. The humidity was 100% too, and it was the opening day of lobster. So we were barely moving, and the Harley engines are, are boiling us. And uh, But we just won a tally award for that particular episode. So I've learned. I, some- I, I, have, I have been with him on a few occasions, and one of them was right before he left on one of these pilgrimages. And there uh, were so many excited Catholic men to take this and share yeah. the adventure. The Emmaus bikers. I love those Latino bikers down there. But, you know, the key to winning the tally award, I found out, have an archbishop on your show. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking with Dr. Scott Hahn, and we're talking about this beautiful new book. I just sent it to my father. It's called Hope to Die. Remember, Therese of Lisieux said to her mother, oh, mother, I wish you would just die. 
because she knew what was waiting for her in heaven. We're going to talk uh, with Dr. Scott Hahn a little bit more about that. You can find him at the St. Paul Center, of course, and uh, you can find us at deepadventure.com. We'll be right back. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. My son, Jeremiah, uh, just moved back to Hawaii. And this is a recorded show. We're still during that time of quarantine, or we call him Darling Quarantine when he came back. He stayed at our house for a couple weeks looking at perfect surf. Uh, he's the one that towed into 85-foot waves and uh, by my friend Crazy Todd on the biggest day, one of the biggest days in 50 years. Uh, and it naturally brings you, he ta- starts up talking about you see the face of God or you know you're in God's hands. And so we started talking about what happens when you die. And one of the questions is that he had, and I said, I'm gonna ask you, is uh, when you die, the, you know, the, the, we talk about the first judgment, the second judgment, uh, you die, but you're, you're, just, you're still in your soul, you don't have your body. Well, what happens uh, when, when, when someone dies? What happens next? Is there, you know, you know what I'm saying? So put it on a man once to live, once to die, and then the judgment. And then when do we, if we make, if we're in heaven, when do we get our bodies and we're resurrected bodies or do we and all that kind of stuff? Okay. So I'm going to, again, step out in terms of, you know, orthodox, faithful, Catholic speculation. <laughs> but before I do, I've got to ask you, how old is your Jeremiah? Oh, he's 39, I believe. Okay. So I've got a Jeremiah, too, who's only oh, really? 28. But he was oh. just ordained earlier this month to the transitional diaconate. He Pray. and our other son, Joe, are both studying for the priesthood for the Steubenville Diocese. Can you so imagine? Six kids, oh. one daughter and five sons, or as I say, one rose and five thorns. And we've also got 19 grandkids from the first I three. want some of those. I, I don't you. have any yet. He, I think oh. I think they're yeah. about to. He just got married recently, so I think Believe hopefully me, that's the best is. The best is yet to come. I mean, I share with you the great adventure of fatherhood. Nothing in my whole life has been as fulfilling as fathering. I mean, if you take everything else and combine them, the cumulative effect, I think, would fall short of the satisfaction, the joy, and the gratitude of fathering six kids who are now ranging from 
age 38 down to 20. He's about to turn 21. <laughs> Our oldest son, Dr. Han the Younger, is now a professor <laughs> of <younger>. scripture. <laughs> yes, he's a professor of scripture at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. Wow. But nothing has been more frustrating to me than fathering too. I mean, it is the most fulfilling experience of my life. Nothing has made me feel more inadequate. So I want mm. to speak to our brothers in Christ and say, hey, look, you're not talking or listening to uh, two perfect dads. You know, I am so flawed. I have failed so many times. God the Father has given me what I needed, but even more, he's made up for what I lacked because I told my kids, ultimately, God is your father. Heaven mm. is your home. And I want to work mm. myself out of a job and become your brother in Christ. But so, I, I, I do remember that moment, Father, I mean, Father Scott, <laughs> Dr. Scott, your two yeah. sons are going to be fathers. No, I do remember that moment in social studies class after lunch when you're kind of falling asleep. It's the most boring class in high school as an <laughs> end of my senior year, I think. And suddenly there was, it was like a revelation to me that I could bring an eternal being into this world. And I would say that was my calling at that moment to be a father, From because from that moment, all I wanted to do was be a father. So I worked three jobs, I went to college, I graduated early, everything I did, I protected my body from drugs, I did, you know, everything I did was for my children from the moment I had, not saying I was a great father, just that I did the best that I could, but but everything from that moment was about, was about being being a, being a father and being there for them to bring an eternal being into existence so yeah, you know mm -hmm. just to build on that I, the, we call it holy matrimony because when you seal that covenant physically there is nothing else you do with your physical body and hers in sealing the covenant and renewing it that makes us more like the lord god when the two became one the one we became nine months later <laughs> We had to come up with a name because our firstborn <laughs> son was the incarnation of our love. Yes. Our life-giving love was embodied and it was like, wow, this is why it's so holy. This is why our world doesn't get it. When they say we're hung up on sex, no. Listen, you guys who want to just reduce it to a passing pleasure, you guys are jaded and addicted. But I tell you, God has a better plan in store. But get back to Jeremiah's question. And yeah, that let's is, talk about you know, what, happens what happens between this and the, yeah. Yeah. You know, I would step out on a limb here, but I would speculate that, you know, every sin that we commit is a personal sin, but it's also a social consequence. Everything that we do that is righteous is not just an isolated private thing. It radiates, it emanates out and benefits other people. So what I would say is this, that when we die, before we get our resurrected bodies in the end, we immediately are confronted with the verdict. Are we going to be saved in glory forever? And even if we pass into purgatory, where we'll experience the certainty of salvation and a joy like we've never known, we'll also experience the pain that will purify us, that will be greater and more painful than any pain we've ever had on earth. And so we ought to remember the dead and pray for them and not presume upon them, but say masses and sacrifice and that sort of thing, which I get a whole chapter in my book, Hope to Die, about that. But then, you know, when we die, the good that we did is still radiating outward. The good consequences are going to emanate not only in our kids, but our grandkids and beyond. And unfortunately, the evil that we did, even though we confessed it and did penance for it, we're also going to see the negative consequences as well. But only at the end of history, when it is appropriate, when it is totally fitting, because only then will the ripple effect be completed. Mm. At that moment, at the end of history, we're going to see God as our Father and realize that my life and bury your life, these lives have been scripted like so many stories, and then suddenly we're going to realize these aren't stories. This is one story scripted by a loving Father who has caused his sons and daughters to achieve the good by reproducing in us Jesus, his Son, so that the little things we did are going to have compounded interest. They're going to be multiplied exponentially precisely because we're united to body to the body of Christ as members of Christ's body. So we're going to find out all the good that was done by Christ through the Holy Spirit, but in us and through us and our loved ones forever until the end. And when we get our resurrected bodies back, we're going to be able to not only look at God, but look at each other and enter into a communion with, with these other saints. I mean, you're going to meet people and have friendships and relations. 
And you're going to know your wife. If she makes it to heaven, you're going to have a greater love than ever before. And, and all of this, again, is going to be multiplied exponentially when our bodies come back, when we get our... And when does that happen? How, when does, so, so, so at the end of time, there's a judgment, which I think you've just... You, is there anything, anything more to say about that? And then there's this moment when we receive our resurrected bodies. Yeah, there's a particular judgment for individuals at the moment of death, and then there is a general judgment at the end. And theologians usually leave it in the realm of the abstract. But I would say the the personal judgment gives us the assurance that we are, you know, it gives us the final verdict. And so we enter into this joy, even if we do have pain to endure. Mm -hmm. But the general judgment is not just some generic thing. It is going to be a communal thing where suddenly we're going to be shown the communal effects of all of the good that we've done in spite of my weakness, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the general resurrection is going to cause us to get bodies that are going to share in Christ's glory so that we can come to know each other. I have a whole chapter on the nature and the properties of the resurrected body because the weakest soul in heaven will be stronger than the the greatest Olympic athlete in human history. You know, you meet a guy and you enter into a friendship for the first time, he'll be a better friend than your best friend in high school could ever be. And again, this is not like exaggerated, puffed up rhetoric. This is what follows from, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. It isn't just quantitatively everlasting. It is qualitatively eternal and off the flipping charts. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Thomas Aquinas have a little bit to say about what our bodies would be like? What, you know, is Scott Hahn going to have a, a beard in heaven? Uh, by the way, I'm wondering. But, uh, you know, what, what, you know, he had something to say about what the nature of our bodies would be in, in heaven. That's right. I mean, he's building upon Jesus and St. Paul in Corinthians 15. He's also building extensively on St. Augustine and the previous fathers and doctors of the church, but Aquinas distills perhaps better than anybody else in the 13th century, and in this one part of the Summa, the various conditions of the body and the properties. All people are going to get their bodies back. The mortality rate is 100%. None of us are going to get out here alive, but the immortality rate is also 100%, because everybody who ever lived and died will still live forever so whether in one heaven, state or another. Either heaven or hell. That's right, a Even state of disgrace and gloom or a state of glory and everlasting but joy. they will have a resurrected body in hell. Right, and Jesus says as much in John 5 and elsewhere. So the bodies that are damned and blessed are going to share the fact that they're going to be the same body that we had, only transformed. So it will be at, we speak of integrity, it'll be in its wholeness. So if you lost, lost an arm, you get it back. Likewise, it's identity. That is, if what about you were my male, broken heart? What about my broken heart from the girl in high school? Like, get my heart fixed? No, I'm just kidding. I'm no sorry. more tears. <laughs> no more broken heart. You'll see her and realize why I'm just kidding. God was I'm just so kidding. gracious. Just I know you are. There isn't even her. Okay. So you, you have identity. It's the same body. You have integrity. You get mm. your arm back or whatever. But you also have this condition known as quality that you are at your peak. You know, the medieval speculated at 33 years of age, we're at your peak because that's how Jesus, that's how old he was when he died. That's speculative and they know that. But the four properties of the bodies that are resurrected to glory, I mean, this is what we can't wait for. Well, let, let's take a break because that's okay. a good spot. We're going to get into those four properties. <laughs> we're with Dr. Scott Hahn. He, he, he speaks at about 60 miles an hour, but gusts to about 120, which is about the same pace I do. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Men, yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bear's Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. 
join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We have Dr. Scott Hahn with us. His new book, Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and the Resurrection of the Body. And we're talking about what the nature of the body will be uh, in heaven. And we maybe talk a little bit about maybe in hell too, but let's talk about the four properties that you were going to bring up. Okay, the first one begins with I, and that is impassibility. Our resurrected bodies will not be able to suffer, die, no weakness, no hunger, no thirst, no exhaustion, full strength all the time. The second one is subtlety. And subtlety is sort of what uh, causes our bodies to be, uh, uh, you know, completely mastered by a righteous soul. You know, I remember mm. back in college when I wanted to pull an all-nighter or two, but I couldn't because I was too exhausted. Or maybe I could, <laughs> but I couldn't think straight because of my brain. You know, well, our souls are subject to the weaknesses of our bodies, but it will no longer be so. And so our bodies are going to have a subtlety that will be unimaginable. You know, I could get to Hawaii by booking a flight, boarding the plane, and then arriving. But the way angels move is such that they think of the place and then they're there because they don't have bodies to slow them down. Well, our bodies are going to have a subtlety that leads to the third property, and that is agility. That is um, mobility, like we can't even imagine, like no supersonic jet has. And so the bodies will be brilliant. They'll be glorified. They're going to be agile. And so, as I mentioned before, the weakest saint in the, 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 the leanest resurrected body will be greater in strength than the greatest Olympic athlete. It's just unimaginable. And then the last thing is clarity or claritas, as the medievals would say, like Aquinas. And clarity is going to be such that we're going to be able to look at each other and know each other and love each other without any walls, without any impediments, without any misunderstanding, not just God. First and foremost, we're going to look at God and he's going to see us and show us to ourselves and how much his love has made us so holy. But at the same time, we're going to have the clarity of our resurrected bodies so that I will look at a total stranger and come to know them better than I could understand my wife on certain evenings, you know? And she sometimes says, Scott, you're opaque. I can't read you. What are you feeling? In heaven, we're going to enter into this joyful translucence where we're going to know each other as sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters in Christ. It will make the happiest family reunion look like a garbage dump in comparison because this is who we are. This isn't plan B. This is what God the Father Almighty intended from the beginning. And so for us to go back, you know, and see in Genesis 2 that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and that's how he became a living being. So when he said, you can eat from any tree except the forbidden fruit, and the day you eat of that, you'll surely die. When they ate in chapter 3, they didn't drop dead physically, but they committed spiritual suicide. They basically snuffed up the life of God in their soul. The Trinity was basically gone. And so this is why original sin for us as Catholics is not being born depraved as it had been for me as a Calvinist, but it mm. is being born deprived of divine life mm. because that's what our first parents forfeited. So to get that back from Christ, that's why Paul calls him the new Adam, the last Adam. This is why the Blessed Virgin is Mary. She's the new Eve because they're at the foot of the cross. When he gives up his breath, he's not simply breathing his last. He's making his breath, the Holy Spirit, the gift of life, life-giving love to make Mary, who is there, giving consent to her son's total sacrifice. She is endowed with the power of the Spirit, the breath, the water, which becomes baptismal, the blood that flows from his piercing side. That's Eucharistic. It's like, if we could see what our guardian angels see at the foot of the cross, our, our, our hearts would melt, our brains would explode, because this is the moment when life is restored to us. So when we are baptized, as Paul says in Romans 6, we are rejoined, reunited to Christ. We are resurrected more than Lazarus was after four days, because he just got his physical body back. That's a resuscitation. But when Jesus is resurrected, basically that humanity of his is divinized. It's made by the power of the Spirit communicable. When we eat that holy body, blood, soul, and divinity, we don't just eat it like a burger and fries and assimilate it to our body. No, He consumes us and unites our mortal flesh to His immortal flesh so as to set up our 
resurrected so that we will be transfigured and glorified. We're not just gonna get our bodies back. The divine life that has been restored to our souls now is more valuable than the physical life we will lose. It's also more vulnerable than our physical life because to commit a mortal sin is to basically repeat our first parent's failure Mm. and to commit spiritual suicide. We've got to fall in love with God and his life in our souls and our loved ones so that we don't reduce it to human rights or freedom to commit mortal sin, we understand that that is extraordinarily stupid and self-destructive for ourselves and our fellow citizens, and we want to rebuild a culture or a civilization of love accordingly. But I mean, this is simply blowing off the dust from these stones we call the Mm. 12 articles of the creed, and we realize why St. Ambrose called them, these are precious gems. Amen. The the, the hope diamond, the pearl of great price. (laughs) I believe in God, the Father Almighty. It can't get any better than this, and it's even better than my words can express. Well, we really wish you would make your point more clear. I mean, what side <laughs> do you stand on? I don't feel strongly about <laughs> any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, oh, the, the Eucharist, the Eucharist, you know, as an athlete, you know, you are what you eat. Yes. And the Eucharist, uh, the Eucharist, it's all in the Eucharist. We had this Eucharistic uh, starvation, you know, going on this year, and we prayed every morning when I do my Ocean Sunrise Catechisms on Facebook Live, put our hands against the door of the church, asking that we begin to receive the Eucharist. We know how important it is, and Jesus really means it. You know, it's the body, unless you eat of my body and drink my flesh, you can have no part in me. That's that resurrection. So I have a question for you. I've got one big concern, and that is that I don't play the harp very good. (laughs) So, I mean, like, am I gonna be relegated way to the back, or what, what am I gonna be doing when I get to heaven? Well, you know, those little chubby if I get to heaven, I'm the harps on the clouds, you know, do show us our lightness of being. They do show us the beauty of music, but that's about all. You know? Because we're going to enter into the fire of God's love and mm-hmm. then look back and realize, okay, 10 trillion years passed by and it felt like a minute. And I mean, if time flies like you're, you know, if time flies when you're having fun, you know, we're going to enter in, into eternity in a way that is just mind blowing, heart blowing too. You know, you just mentioned this pandemic and the quarantine and all of that. You know, I I had one of the most comforting or, you know, this conversation with my daughter several weeks ago that brought such consolation because she's a faithful Catholic, but she's a full-time mom with four kids, busy, exhausted. And she said to me about two months into this pandemic, after she had not gone to mass for that entire time, she's like, Dad, I never realized how much I took the mass for granted. Mm -hmm. And then she said... I find myself hungering for Holy Communion in a whole new way. And I'm like, well, first of all, you have blessed your dad more than you could ever know. Second of all, you have echoed, I hope, what millions of other Catholics are thinking and feeling and longing for. And so, you know, it reminds me of that old song back in the 70s, Joni Mitchell's Big Yellow Taxi, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Exactly. And now that we're coming back, it's like, oh, Lord, help us to make up for lost time. Forgive us for taking so much grace for granted. Well, when I, you know, in Hawaii, we have a saying, kuleana. It means your, your kuleana, your responsibility, your stewardship. It's more than that. It's almost a sense of ownership of the role, the, the jobs God's given you in life. Will I have kuleana in heaven? Will I have a mission in heaven? Will I, what, what, what kind, will I have a purpose? Will I be doing things, or will I be just be playing the harp on the fifth row? Maybe the five millionth row. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, it sounds like kuleana is just another word for covenant. And mm. we're going to enter into not just a renewal of the covenant, but the consummation of the covenant. Our mission is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself for the love of God who is our Father. And so I can assure you, that Kuliana is going to be on steroids for eternity. Mm -hmm. And once again, you know, I thought he was exaggerating. No, he was actually understanding. (laughs) This is beyond Kuliana, you know. But I mean, this reminds me too of why it is the Eucharist is so crucial. You know, the Eucharist was instituted by our Lord using his own body, transforming the bread into his body. And that's what caused his death to be more than just another Roman execution. Because if the Eucharist is just a meal, then Calvary is just an execution. But only if the Eucharist is the Passover of the new lamb, the new covenant, does that you, does that execution become the consummation of the sacrifice, precisely because he's not losing his life like every other victim of this Roman torture. He made his life a gift of love when he instituted the Eucharist as where the sacrifice was initiated. 
that sacrifice is consummated at Calvary. So the execution is not only transformed into a sacrifice, but Easter Sunday is what transforms that sacrifice into a sacrament, the blessed sacrament, because when we profess our faith in the real presence of Christ's body, it's the same body that was in the upper room, the same body that was hanging on the cross, the same body that was buried in the tomb, but the precise form of his body in the Holy Eucharist is the resurrected, the divinized, the glorified, the ascended, the enthroned body of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And again, our guardian angels would say, well, yeah, duh, but I mean, we've got to see <laughs> that the resurrection was ordered for the Eucharist. It was to make Christ's humanity not only divinized for himself, but communicable to us so that we could enter into the glory. He took what is ours, mortal human nature, to give us what is his, divine glory. And it's like, whoa, okay, these articles of the creed have a cumulative effect that make me think that we have not professed it too little, but we have contemplated, we have not professed it too much, but we have contemplated it too little. We're this talking, faith, we're oh, talking so. with Dr. Scott. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Hahn, we've run out of time, but... Uh, you, you, at least, Claire, you know, thank you so much for your time with us. And I hope that maybe you'll think about coming back and joining us again so we can finish the that. Last, we can finish yeah. the rest of what you were saying. It's a real horrible thing to have the responsibility cut off, Dr. Han. Um, uh, Dr. Han, where people can find you where? What's the best place for them to fi find you? Well, I, I, I have a public page on Facebook, Scott Hahn. I also have scotthahn.com, but most especially the apostolate that Kimberly and I established 20 years ago is called the St. Paul Center. So go to stpaulcenter.com. St. is S-T, paulcenter.com, and you'll find all kinds of resources, beginner, intermediate, advanced, in biblical literacy for our uh laity and biblical fluency for our clergy and Beautiful. our educators reading the bible from the heart of the church and Life i love saint paul i spent i've yeah. spent years just studying hey we gotta go so i gotta we gotta take a break till next week you guys uh this is the bear wozniak adventure you can find us at deepadventure.com may the breath of the holy spirit aloha you aloha hey man I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.